Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my review of the Canon EOS R8 full-frame mirrorless camera. I do want to start, however, by saying a big thank you to Camera Canada for giving me a loaner of the camera and the kit lens here. I've had a difficult time getting uh, Canon loaners over the last little while, and they have been great in trying to help me out on that. So, big thank you to them. Going back about five years at this point, Canon released their first budget mirrorless cam full frame mirrorless camera which was the EOS RP. Now, it had some severe crippling flaws to it, but it was a camera that a lot of people liked and continued to like despite those flaws. You know, things like a very dated sensor and very very poor video performance. The EOS R8 takes a lot of what we loved about the RP, but then adds in some really fantastic things. The performance of the R6 Mark II with great autofocus, including tracking up to 40 frames per second with the electronic shutter, a great new sensor, and finally, very, very good video specs as well. Best of all, the price point stays really, really low. 1500 US MSRP, although it's already discounted to 1300 at the moment. So is this a camera worth buying? Well, let's explore together right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber, and use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So one of the things that I loved about the RP and that I love about the R8 is that we have fantastic ergonomics for such a small camera. I'm really surprised at how well in this you know, compact body my hand actually fits on the grip. Even though I have bigger hands and a lot of similar models, I end up having to put my pinky somewhere else. There's actually just enough room that I can fit everything on there and the camera actually feels comfortable in my hand. And I will note that one thing that Canon has done really well that Sony has not is the camera body is wide enough to where you can put your fingers around that grip and still have room to where your knuckles are not hitting against the barrel of the lens that you have attached. So great job there on the basic ergonomics of the camera. It's something that feels great in the hand. And I just find as someone who uses and reviews a lot of cameras, when a camera feels great in your hand, it does change your perception of the camera itself. So kudos to Canon for doing a great job with ergonomics. The weight here is just a pound or 461 grams, even with the battery and the memory card included. And basically, if you're familiar with the overall layout of the EOS RP, you're going to be pretty familiar with this camera as well. Now, as far as the specifications, we have a viewfinder here that is only so-so, 2.36 million dots. Canon's viewfinders are fairly good, I find, but that's not an amazing amount of resolution, and certainly there are competitors with higher resolution, though I will note that uh, cameras like Sony's uh, A7C or A7C Mark II, you know, they're no better when it comes to the viewfinder. Now, what we don't have that we have in a lot of uh, Canon's higher models is the ability for the shutter blades to come down to protect the sensor from dust. But I find that this camera compensates by being really aggressive with its cleaning. Not just a cleaning cycle when you shut the camera down, but if you take a lens off or you put the lens back on, you will hear that cleaning mechanism doing its vibrations to help to keep the shutter clean. Seems to be doing the job. I didn't notice any issues with dust along the way. Now, while the viewfinder is a bit under spec, the LCD screen back here is actually really fantastic. We have the typical very angled type screen. It is three inches, so you could put it in a lot of different positions, but Canon still remains pretty much tops in the business when it comes to the actual touchscreen capabilities. They're responsive. I find that the menu is just really designed well for navigation with touch, and so touch integration really helps a lot. 
And that's a good thing because we are missing things like a joystick, which is very nice for navigation. And instead of a third wheel down here, we have a directional pad or D-pad there. So the touchscreen really does help to provide some control points that are missing otherwise. Now, the two different wheels that are here, one right behind the shutter button and the other at the back, they operate very nicely with good precision. And likewise for the various buttons. So I will note, you only have the basic buttons. There's no space for custom buttons here. So you're gonna to have to reprogram buttons to custom function if you want something other than their intended function. But no, just extra buttons that are designed for you to program to some other purpose. As far as other limitations here, we do not have any kind of side mounted uh, card slot. So the card is a single UHS, UHS 2 compatible SD card slot that is unfortunately down here in the battery compartment, my least favorite positioning. And on that note, we also have a smaller capacity battery here um, that is only rated for 150 shots, though, I mean, it does easily exceed that. The one place I think you'll have more of an issue if, is if you wanna shoot a fair bit of 4K video. Uh, shooting video tends to burn through batteries fast, and so you're probably going to want some spares uh, for that purpose in particular. Now, like the R6 Mark II, we have the new positioning where we have the on, off, and lock over here on the right side. And over on the left side is a ability to switch between the still setup and the video setup. Now, I love having that ability to be able to switch between those two things, which means you can have custom menus and custom buttons set up, a different setup for both stills and for video. What I don't love, however, is many of the other older Canon uh, mirrorless bodies, this is where the on off switch was. And so uh, there's a lot of time just because of muscle memory, like with my R5, this is where it's located. So instead of turning the camera on or more importantly, turning it off, I'll switch it into video mode and start draining the battery instead. So I don't love that, but at least Canon has been consistent. This is now the third model that I've seen where it's using this position. And so hopefully it is something that they will continue to do consistently that will help people just have the muscle memory to look for it at that side. Now, like the R6 Mark II, we have improved communications. You can directly connect to a phone with the correct cable. You can use this as a webcam without any additional software. It has faster Wi-Fi capability, some positive things there. Uh, but there is a, a major negative here, and that is one thing that we don't have is in-body image stabilization. No IBIS on this model. And, uh, you know, Obviously, that's a place where Canon has, has cut cost, but I will note that unfortunately, a lot of the lenses that really suit this camera really well, like the RF 28 millimeter F2.8, or uh, we have the 16 millimeter F2.8, the 50 millimeter F1.8, all of these are compact, lightweight lenses that really suit the camera, but they don't have uh, lens-based stab stabilization, so you're left with no stabilization at all. So that is obviously going to be a factor for some people. Now, there is a kit lens that you can purchase with the camera and it is the 24 to 50 millimeter. This is an F4.5 to 6.3. It does have image stabilization. It's not a fantastic lens. It's okay. Uh, however, it is only an additional 200 bucks and it does allow you to get that stabilization for shooting video, for example. And so you might want to consider that. I have one other kind of, you know, more minuscule complaint, and that is that we continue to have a micro HDMI output. That's just not, it's, it's a fairly flimsy way to exit with a fairly heavy duty HDMI cable. I don't love that, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a cheap camera, so not necessarily a big deal. The kind of the biggest issue though with Canon in general that I do have to mention is the fact that this remains a completely closed platform. So I, I lamented the fact, uh, you know, I mentioned a few lenses that work well on it, but you know, as I kind of rack my brain at all of the reasonably priced, you know, prime lenses that you could buy to go to this camera, you know, there is a total of maybe six or seven that I can come up with. Whereas if I'm doing the same kind of mental math for Sony, I can go 30 to 40 lenses very easily with a, you know, a, a higher level of performance than basically almost all that's available here. So, I mean, that remains a serious factor. I will note if you're one of the lucky ones that managed to grab a couple of the Sam early Samyang RF lenses before Canon shut them down, the 14 millimeter F2.8 and the 85 millimeter F1.4 do still work here. So fingers crossed that that uh, stays the case with future models and future firmware updates. But at the moment I can report that they still work. 
Now, when it comes to the shutter here, we have two options and neither of them is, is a fully mechanical. What we do have is an electronic first curtain mechanical shutter. And with that, you have a couple of limitations. You have a one four thousandth shutter speed limit. And the other limitation is you only get six frames per second as far as your burst mode. Now you also have the option to go to a fully electronic shutter. And of course there, the headline is you can get up to 40 frames per second. Uh, you can also shoot up to one eight thousandth of a second in terms of shutter speed. And they've done a fairly good job with the readout here. So you know, rolling shutter is, is not too bad. There are a few other limitations. There's no flash sync with the electronic shutter. You're not gonna be able to use things like uh, flicker uh, prevention or anti-flicker. And then your you know, other limitation is, is that instead of a 14-bit conversion of the raw files, it's a 12-bit. I don't know that you'll actually notice that, but just note that there is some give and take with both of those options. Now, if you're using the electronic front uh, curtain shutter here, it's you're going to have basically no buffer limitations with that because it's shooting slow enough that the camera has plenty of time to clear the buffer. But if you're using the fully electronic shutter and 40 frames per second, your limitation is 56 full size RAWs. But if you go to C RAW or the compressed RAW option, which by the way is a great option on these cameras, it's very, very clean, very, very good technology, uses little space. And as a byproduct, that increases up to about a hundred shots before the buffer fills. And by the way, I shot at least that shooting both compressed RAW and JPEG and I had I never ran into a buffer limit. And so I, th I think that there is, that's really not bad for a camera at this level. And also you have the option to do their raw burst mode, which does a, a little bit of pre-recording, I believe at 30 frames per second for a half second before you actually fully depress the shutter. So make sure that you don't miss the moment in capturing the action. So very, very useful. And as we're going to see, as we shift towards talking about autofocus, Autofocus is incredibly impressive for a budget camera. I don't think there's any budget camera that is competing with the, the actual autofocus system that's in this camera because it's inherited from the, uh, the R6 Mark II, which is inherited from the top of the line sports camera R3. So this is an incredible, basically 100% shutter covering. And it, I mean, I found that tracking is just effortless. Uh, it does an incredible job of tracking and in this burst of, of Nala, this is all at 40 frames per second. She's moving fast and if you've been watching my reviews, you know that this is a, a difficult target for a lot of cameras. I was just shooting with the RF 24 to 105 F4 LIS. Every frame is in, is in perfectly in focus and over just a few seconds I shot nearly 100 shots in that burst and it's just effortless. And so, I mean, incredible, incredible autofocus. I loved it as for portraits and I shot a number of portraits, including with that forbidden uh, Sam Yang 85 millimeter F 1.4. And it was beautiful for that. Got really, really great results. And so uh, just fantastic for that. One of the things I love about Canon that I wish Sony would adopt is that they have an auto mode for subject detection that actually works really, really well. And so instead of continually having to worrying to make sure that you have it in the proper mode to make sure that you're getting the proper tracking, you can just set it in that auto mode and it just seems to work. And so I could switch from subject to subject to subject and it just focused as it should. Really, really fantastic. I found it also to be a very effective autofocus system in low light. Uh, they are, you know, they claim it's down to a minus 6.5 EV. That's if you're shooting with an F1.2 lens. But even with lesser lenses, I found that the fo focus system remains really responsive in low light situations. Very, very good. And the RP uh, had terrible, terrible video autofocus. That is not at all the case here. The uh, focus for video is fantastic. It utilizes the same focus system, same subject detection, and it does a brilliant job. So bottom line is that this is a top-notch, top-of-the-heap focus system for this class of camera. And I'm actually shocked by how little it's watered down compared to some of the higher-end models. I mean, this is great. It made the camera a lot of fun to use. Now on the video side of things, this is another huge area of upgrade relative to their, their previous compact body, a full frame budget camera. Now, now we have up to 4K 60 and that is with 6K oversampling. That's full sensor readout, no crop factor. 
That means that the footage looks really, really fantastic from this. I'm very impressed by how clean it looks. There is an APS-C mode available, which will allow you to use crop sensor lenses, for example. And, and obviously that's gonna be much more useful for video than it is for stills when you're talking about just a 24 megapixel sensor. And so, I mean, that gets you something like eight megapixels, I think, or maybe just a hair more than that when it comes to stills mode, but for video, it's it's fine. And so it does allow you to give you more options as far as the, the lenses that you can use. It also, despite having this compact, compact body, it does a fairly good job with heat dissipation. And so, you know, there's a limit at 4K60 where Canon estimates you're good about 30 minutes before you run into any heating issues. But if you're shooting at 4K30, that jumps up to two hours. So not a, a huge limiting factor there. There is no basic recording limit, but obviously that there's gonna be the practical of either the battery or the heating that's gonna keep you from recording, you know, endlessly. The other thing here is that we have up to 180 frames per second in full HD for very, very slow motion. We also are included here things like C-Log3, HDR, PQ. I mean, this is really, really great video specs when you consider where Canon was a few years ago, very, very miserly in putting, you know, any anything that might endanger their, their cine lineup of bodies, they have seemed to have relaxed all of that. Now, the one thing that we've lost relative to the R6 Mark II, even though we have a lot of the same video specs, is that there is no HDMI output of 6K ProRes RAW, and so you don't have the same kind of HDMI kind of off-site recording. But in camera, it's, it's 10-bit, it's good quality footage, it looks great. And so, again, for a budget camera that right now you can get for $1,300, you know, that's great video specs there. Now, also great is the improved sensor. Now, on paper, you might say, well, wait a minute, the, the RP had a 26 megapixel sensor, and this is just a 24 megapixel sensor. Yes, however, that sensor was a dated one inherited back from the 6D Mark II, and I, that sensor was disappointing when I reviewed it in the 6D Mark II, and it was disappointing when it was inherited in the RP. Yes, the resolution point looked okay, but it had poor dynamic range. Color wasn't as great as what we expect from Canon. This new sensor is much, much improved. In fact, Canon claims, boasts, that it is actually able to produce more detail than even what the 30 megapixel sensor, for example, in the Canon EOS R does. I don't know whether or not that's true or not. I can't necessarily verify, but what I can say is it produces very, very nice detailed images. 6,000 by 4,000 pixels is the native resolution. And that's not anything mind blowing. And frankly, I'm accustomed to shooting with all high resolution bodies, but I, the images look fine out of it. And I will say that it is kinder to you know, a little bit weaker <laughs> lenses like the kit lens and other lenses than obviously what the sensor in my R5 does. And so you can get away with a little bit weaker lens performance because the sensor isn't quite as dynamic. So we're going to break things down because we've got vastly improved dynamic range it's over two and a half stops better than what was in the RP, for example. We've got great ISO performance basically throughout most of the, the native range. And uh, and while we don't have anything like MRAW or, or, or SRAW here, which would be less useful, frankly, on a lower resolution body, we do have those great uh, compression options. You have the ability to shoot HEIC files, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So some great options as far as the, the codecs and the file formats there. But we're gonna dive in and we're going to look at in detail at dynamic range, high ISO performance, a little bit at the color and so that you can get a sense of the sensor performance here. And I'll circle back to you for a conclusion in just a few minutes. So let's start by taking a look at resolution and color. So I chose this image mostly because I have basically the same image taken with a lens that I consider to be pretty good optically, which is the RF 28mm f2.8. So if we look here at a pixel level, you can see detail and contrast is very good across the frame. And, and so no problem there. However, I also took a nearly identical shot with the inexpensive RF 24 to 50 millimeter f 4.5 to 6.3 kit lens. And so again, you can see looking here that you know, performance looks pretty good. Now putting these two images and thus lenses side by side, you can see that yes, there is a little bit more contrast and detail in the RF 28 millimeter version. 
you can see looking at this area that things are just a little bit softer and texture is just a little bit mushier. But my point is, is that if you were to put these on a higher resolution body, like my 45 megapixel ESR5, this lens would look a whole lot worse by comparison because the 28 millimeter actually holds up okay on the high resolution sensor. So it allows you to use some of these lenses that maybe aren't quite as amazing optically. You know, you can see here, you could tell it's this lens is much sharper and has a contrast up here, but it's not a radical difference. And this is still acceptably good. Likewise, in this shot, when we're talking about resolution, you can take a look you know, anywhere you're looking in the frame on this shot and actually shot this with the Samyang RF 14 millimeter F 2.8 that everything looks really, really nice in the shot. And so the thing is, is that I think you could crop down in this and still, depending on your, your application, you could still get something acceptable out of it. I prefer higher resolution bodies for obvious reasons for that kind of thing. But when you consider the fact that most people are sharing their images primarily on social media sites, I mean, the native resolution of 6,000 by 4,000 pixels is going to be vastly reduced to those kind of sharing platforms anyway. Now, Canon colors tend to be good, and I found that to be the case with the R8 as well. I found that saturation levels are nice. There's nothing that's garish or overblown here, but colors look rich. That's true here with uh, this shot of Nala, and you can see detail looks really good. You know, colors look very, very nice. Now, my favorite portrait lens that I actually have on an RF mount is that Samyang 85mm f1.4, and it's a really, really lovely portrait lens. Just overall. One thing I will say about it is that it does tend to be a little bit warm. And so you can see here that skin tones are a little bit on the warm side. So I'm going to look more at a few shots from the Canon actually EF 35 millimeter F 1.4 Mark II, a lens that I love that I used for this portrait series as well. You can see that skin tones is something that Canon does really well. It looks really, really nice. The colors in the dress of the model look great. Here's another fuller shot here and you can see, you know, the colors are the background everything is is nice but colors really pop of the the model here and so in skin tones again look really, really nice so that's another area where i think ken does a really good job and the r8 sensor is excellent so let's talk iso this is something that in the r6 mark ii i thought was fantastic and obviously with the same sensor i expect the same here so here is our base iso we'll take a quick kind of stroll around here you can see shadows look clean and inky you can see no noise there looking inside the uh, the mirror of my slr here you can see that it looks nice and clean look at the what the grip should look like here as far as the pattern the contrast the color consistencies, the swatches, the timer face, all of those things. We'll see all of that holds up as we move up in ISO. So if we jump up to ISO 800, which by the way is a piece of cake for modern cameras, you can see that all of those things look just fine. I mean, no issues. There's really no apparent noise that's being introduced. Shadows still look nice and dark. If we jump up to ISO 1600, we can see taking a look here that everything continues to look good. Uh, there's no color inconsistencies there in the grip. You can see there's just the tiniest bit of noise starting on the mirror and in the shadow information, but shadows look consistently black. No issues there. Now on up to 3200, and here's the place where I would just start to expect to see anything really serious. Fortunately, this camera does really well at the kind of more moderate ISOs of 3200, 6400, even 12,800, as we're going to see. Contrast still looks good there in that. You can see that there's a tiny bit of noise in on the mirror, but you're not going to notice it outside of a pixel level. Likewise, here there's a tiniest bit of pattern noise there but shadows are nice and consistent. Everything looks good. Looking at these color swatches, there's a little bit of pattern noise there, but it all looks good and the colors still look very consistent. Now at 6400, so we've still got our base as a comparison there. So relative to 62 base ISO, you can see there's definitely more pattern noise now in the color swatches. But if you look at the colors, the colors still look consistent. Blacks are now not quite as dark because of a little bit of pattern noise. We can see here there's still good contrast in the texture of the SLR uh, inside here. Again, just a tiny bit of noise there, no problem. Shadows look good and clean. A little bit of extra noise starting to show up in the checkerboard pattern but again we're still controlling things really quite well if we step back and look at everything at a global level i mean it really doesn't look any different than what it did at iso 100 if we jump up to iso 12800 we could see at a global level everything continues to look really nice 
things like that actually have texture, like the, uh, the grip here, still looks very nice and clean. Very, very little noise. There's a little bit there inside that mirror, but still looking good. You could see just a little bit more here, but again, it's it's fine. It's fairly consistent. It's patterned nicely. The shadows are still looking fairly inky, though you're getting a little bit of that noise, kind of hotter pixels. That's going to reduce contrast a little bit, and that's the primary thing that we see here in the color swatch is just a little bit less contrast. Now, by the time you get to ISO 25,600, you're starting to get into seriously high ISO territory. And again, if you're looking at a global level, really not much to be concerned about. Again, shadows are not quite as inky. And if we punch in at a pixel level, 100%, you can see that now the noise is starting to look rougher. Looking over here on the grip here, there's a little bit noise, more noise on the mirror area, but the grip colors are still looking consistent as they should. And up here in the color swatches, there's not really any kind of honeycomb pattern or grid that's showing up so far so good, really. Now, if we compare 25,600 to the next full stop, which is ISO 51,200, you can see that there's quite a bit of contrast that is lost during that process. And so now, whereas we still had a pretty dark uh, background, inky background, here you can see that there is a little bit of a kind of grid pattern starting up, much more noise showing there. And if we look down here, just you can tell contrast is starting to be lost due to the amount of noise that's there. At the same time, looking at it globally, you could use that image certainly on social media uh, sharing levels. It would look just fine. Now, the final stop from 51,200 to 102,400, this is the final stop in the native range. You can see that we've lost a lot more by this point. Now, this is the first time looking at a global image. You can say, okay, I can see that this is a high ISO image. But to be fair, we're at 102,400. And so I think that you should avoid this in most situations. But this at 51,200, yeah, I think you could still use that. Let me give you some examples. Now, this is, I would consider, a best case example. I like monochrome for high ISO shots better because, yes, you can see that, that fine kind of pattern noise that is everywhere, but it looks like film grain. It looks natural, and you can see that there's still a very useful amount of detail here. The image kind of works despite it being far less from perfect. More imperfect is a shot like this. And so in both of these shots, I shot them in nearly dark rooms. There's just a little bit of light from a, a crack in the door that's bleeding in here. You can see that obviously on a positive note, focus was still really good. So there's detail there. But now you can see in this image what should have been a uniform background. You can see that it's got some some noise going on there. And so a less than than perfect result in that regard. So the final thing we'll look at here is dynamic range. So we're going to start by taking a look at underexposure and then trying to recover shadows. So here we're starting at a three stop of underexposure. You can see the original shot, what it looked like here. I've added three stops of exposure back in in Lightroom in post. And so uh, we're kind of looking for some of those same things that tend to be noisy at high ISO, uh, color splotches, extra noise. You can see that recovering the shadow information is really, really clean um, at this level it's coming back without any kind of issues at all. Now, if we jump up to four stops here, you can see that everything's starting to get really, really crushed, but you can see it recovers nicely with good looking contrast, nice, clean looking results. Looking through this zone here, there is, I think, just the beginnings of a little bit of color noise, but it is so faint you really can't see it. Very, very little pattern noise inside there. And again, this is still looking really, really clean down here. And if you look at the image out of whole, it's, it's very, very good. Finally, at five stops of, of underexposure, that's a lot. And so as you can see here, it's recovering still really, really nicely. If we jump in here, you can see there's just a little bit of some color blotching there. We're kind of finding the limit at this point, though it's not a hard limit. You can see that, yes, there is more noise. I also find that some of the textures are maybe not as crisp because the camera is doing a little bit of smoothing to kind of correct. But overall, I think this is still a really good performance. Very few hot pixels in this area. And I don't think that the detail is quite as good, but again, it's still a usable image. So if we go the other direction here at two stops of overexposure, you can see that in the original image, there's different color swatches where the colors have bled out. The texture color in the surface of the SLR, or excuse me, of this timer, it has been lost. And likewise here in the spine of this book and some of these things, there's there's colors that have become blown out. 
You can see in the recovery though, reducing that exposure by two stops, everything globally looks really good. Colors back in the, uh, the timer face, these color swatches, the color has been kind of returned there. And if we jump in and we look at areas that could be hot spots that would be blown out, they've been recovered and the textures are all back as they should be there. That's true over here as well. You can see the areas that were kind of blown out here. They have been brought back likewise along there. You know, color has been restored. If we look down here at the spine of this book, you can see that it was starting to look blown out and uh, the blacks were kind of black levels were gone. Essentially, you can see that all that has bounced back just fine. We find the limit at three stops of overexposure. You can see that there is things that are not recovered on the timer face. It's not a consistent pattern anymore. Some of the color swatches are not fully back for this yellow, for example. It's back along the edges, but not quite in the center. So things have been lost there. And likewise here, if we jump in and we look at a few of like the hot spot areas, say on the face of the, uh, the pin tacks here, you can see that not all of those textures are back here and here. Looking down at the spine of this book, you can see it has kind of like a washed out kind of look where it hasn't really recovered the proper contrast there. And is basically always the case at four stops, it's just a mess. You can see that contrast is not recovered. The image has a an odd look to it. It's just not right. And so there's definitely a little bit more limits on the upper end when you're recovering highlights than there is on the, the underexposed or shadow end. So if you're going to want to bias a, an image in any direction, a little bit of underexposure is easier to recover for, leaving you more room in the highlights. I found for real world use, there was plenty of dynamic range. You can see in this shot that I was able to bring back the amount of detail I wanted here in the trees and in the shadow areas. You can see at the same time, however, I've been able to bring a little bit more color back into the sky. The blues are a little bit richer. And so it's great. You can see some of these clouds like here and here that were almost lost, uh, kind of blown out here that have been recovered. And so for landscape type images, I found that there was good dynamic range for doing that. And then of course, for other type images, say portraits, you can recover plenty in the shadows to uh, be able to edit to taste. And so it, it is doing the job that I want. And according to photons to photos, it's ranked at about right under 11.6 stops of dynamic range, which is certainly very competitive with all of the cameras pretty much in this class. So in conclusion, this is a budget camera that frankly is a lot of fun to use. I really enjoyed using the camera actually far more than what I expected. I, I had relatively low expectations and the camera exceeded my expectations. It has a great sensor and it has a, a brilliant autofocus system. The fact that it feels good in the hand, it's small and it's lightweight, easy to throw into a bag. It made it a lot of fun to use. It is held back, I think, above all by the lack of in-body image stabilization and a lack of lenses available in RF mount at this point. And you can say, well, you can use a lot of EF lenses via adapter. That's true, but other systems don't require you to do that. Other systems have a lot more options because they've opened up to, you know, other brands, Sigma, Tamron, Vildtrox, Samyang, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm really, really looking forward to the day when Canon does the same. At the same time, however, I don't want to diminish how much I enjoyed the camera. I enjoyed using it a lot. I predict it will sell a lot for Canon because it allows an alternative. Typically at this price point, you're looking at an APS-C camera and there's a lot of people going to say, hey, I can get a full frame for that same price. Yes, you can. And it happens to be a great camera. I'm Dustin Abbott. And if you want more information, you can look at my full text review that's linked in the description. Buying links there as well. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.